Time for another defunct team. In this video we're looking at the Pottsville Maroons, and we're in luck, as we have a special guest in the Retro Sports studio here today. Someone who actually grew up watching the Maroons in person, so I'd like to welcome to the channel, Pops. Welcome Pops, glad you can join us. Have you seen Stacy at the grocery store? Oh, she dresses like a two-bit floozy. Uh, the next time you go to the grocery store, I want you to tell her that she dresses like a flipped up dandy and that I said that muffins don't exist. Uh, no, Pops, the Pottsville Maroons. Yes, I... I remember the Pottsville Maroons. You see, my sister and my father and I would go to see the Maroons play every weekend. We would gather the snow into balls and put lemon juice on top of these tasty treats and then throw them in the eyes of the other team's players. We needed the Maroons to win, you see. My father had a gambling problem. He, he would bet everything we had on those games. And the ponies, he would bet on the greyhounds, and the weasels. I mean, really anything that you could wager money. Where well, was he even bet my sister? I have no idea what became of her. Damn, dude. Uh... Anyways, during the 1910s, it was common among the coal mining towns of eastern Pennsylvania to form local football teams. The Pottsville Club evolved from one of these small local teams into the Pottsville Eleven, established in 1920. I used to work in the coal mines with my sister. How old were you and your sister at the time? Oh, I was about nine. Yeah, and my sister was six. You see, mining wasn't as difficult as you'd think. You just start your day in hollow tune and then mentally black out for, oh, uh, 20 hours or so, and then you're all done. Oh, uh, my sister unfortunately never made it out of those mines. We had a cave in. Never saw her again. I thought your dad lost her in a bed. No, no, no. Uh, uh, my father didn't gamble. His vice was good times and loose women. I remember he once took me to a show where two young ladies tried to hide this very large- Okay, okay, that's enough. This is a- this is a family-friendly- This is a channel. This is a YouTube channel. Let's stay on topic. Anyways, the Pottsville Eleven's roster was mostly made up of firemen working for the Yorkville Hose Company. Their home field was Minersville Park and played an independent schedule. In 1922, the Eleven attracted new sponsorship of businessmen Harold Kingsbury, Ivan Hines, and Frank Shoneman, who brought in talented professional players such as Carl Beck, Benny Boynton, and Stan Kofall. In these first independent years, Pottsville had a winning record and drew strong local crowds. In 1924, clubs in East Pennsylvania circuit decided to form a league known as the Anthracite League. Pottsville was purchased by local surgeon John G. Doc Striegel for $1,500 and moved the team to the new league. This would be the season Pottsville adopted the Maroon name. According to club legend, the team ordered new jerseys from local sporting goods supplier Joe Zacco, telling him that the color wasn't important. So, they ended up with Maroon jerseys. The club signed star players Larry Conover, Harry Robb, and Wilbur Pete Henry for this season from the NFL champion Canton Bulldogs, to the annoyance of NFL president Joseph Carr. Wilbur Henry once shook my hand, and then he immediately punched my father for t t trying to throw a large metal rod at him. Yeah. By the end of the league's only season, the Maroons achieved an overall record of 12 wins, 1 loss, and draw, and captured the Anthracite League title. After this, Pottsville Maroons applied for and received an NFL franchise. The NFL is an overrated upstart league. Full of overpaid hot dogs. Nothing but flash, no show. You'll never see a legal fist fight in an NFL game. Well, I, I remember once when I was a young man of 17, I, I saw Stan Kofall take on three other players and a stray dog in the middle of the third quarter with nothing but his wits in a broken bottle. 17? I thought you said you were like nine or something. Oh, oh no, I, I was a fully grown bear at this time, swimming around in the Columbia River, eating my weight in salmon. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and mute your mic for a second. There we go. Oh, no, that's my lemon drop. Have you, you threw my lemon drops away? Anyways, the Maroons were accepted into the NFL in 1925, despite Minersville Park being small by league standards. Pottsville had favorable logistics. It wasn't too far from Frankfurt, home of the Yellow Jackets. Pennsylvania's blue laws, which prohibited football on Sundays, were not enforced in Pottsville, allowing traveling clubs to play in Frankfurt Saturday and Pottsville Sunday. Lemon drops. Pottsville recruited new talent for the 1925 season, due to many of their players returning to their former NFL teams, picking up Walter French, Jack Ernst, Eddie Doyle, and Charlie Berry. Coach Dick Rock insisted players lived in the Pottsville area, allowing the club to hold regular practices, giving the Maroons an edge for the upcoming season. 
and it apparently helped. In the 1925 season, the Pottsville Maroons shut out multiple opponents, knocked out football legend Red Grange, literally, twice in one game, causing him to quit and walk off the field, and at the season's end, were the top team in the NFL standings. In the time before playoffs, you'd think the Maroons' finish in first place would earn them the championship. However, their first NFL season is not without its controversy. After this season, but before the champion was declared, the NFL allowed its teams to continue scheduling matches to make additional money. The Maroons held a game in Philadelphia against the Notre Dame All-Stars, which they won 9-7. However, there was protest from the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets as the Maroons held the match in the Yellow Jackets' territory. Due to this, the NFL suspended the Pottsville Maroons, allowing the Chicago Cardinals to hastily schedule two games against the Hammond Pros and Milwaukee Badgers, which they would win, improve their record and voted 1925 NFL champions. These last two games are suspect, however, as the Badgers and Pros rosters had already disbanded being replaced with local high school players. NFL President Joseph Carr would punish the Badgers and Cardinals and even threaten to award the championship to the Maroons, but never did. Cardinals owner Chris O'Brien argued that his team did not deserve to take the title over a team which had beaten them fairly, and that the Milwaukee and Hammond games were to entice the Chicago Bears into one final match, as it would have drawn large attendance. The Cardinals themselves wouldn't claim the 1925 championship until 1933 after an ownership change. As for Pottsville, feeling they were the rightful champions, created their own trophy made out of coal. The Maroons' coal trophy would later go on display at the NFL Hall of Fame in Canton. I, I remember when they were expelled from the league. And what? Damn you, button. It was because all of the players decided to urinate where the opposing huddle was. It was a completely legal tactic in those days. Okay. The following 1926 season, the Maroons were reinstated into the NFL, as the NFL feared the Maroons may jump to the newly formed American Football League. No, oh, we had a we had a really big party whenever when they came back to the NFL. Oh, uh, that was whenever we had that one woman from uh, who? Uh, where was she from? Now oh, it, it was either. I couldn't remember if she was from, would have a, 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 this decanter, and it was filled with the most magical sweet wine that one could possibly imagine. You would drink a little thimble full of that elixir and pass out upon your divan in the rumpus room for well over eight hours, completely devoid of any money whatsoever in your house. That was how we celebrated the Feast of St. Winscloth. Anyways, this year the Maroons remained a strong club within the league, finding themselves in the championship hunt yet again. This run would end at the hands of the Chicago Bears, defeating the Pottsville Maroons 9-7, with the Maroons finishing in third place with a record of 10 wins, 2 draws, and 2 losses. At this point, financial issues began to affect the team, and the 1927 season, as the Maroons lost several star players and the ones who remained began to show their age, resulting in a 5-8 record and the start of the Pottsville Maroons' decline. In 1928, the Maroons owner Doc Striegel relinquished operating control of the Maroons and loaned the team to a group of three players, Herb Stein, Pete Henry, and Duke Osborne, with Pete Henry taking over coaching duties. Despite this, the decline of the team continued and the Maroons finished the 1928 season in eighth place with a record of 2-8. Striegel would sell the club during the offseason to a New England-based partnership that included Maroons standout George Kennelly. The new owners relocated the franchise to Boston prior to the 1921 season, where it was renamed the Bulldogs, thus ending the Pottsville Maroons. When the Maroons finally went to Boston, we were finally out of a way for my father to lose all of our money. So, we drove in our car down the Hudson River to New York City, and we were never seen again. Today, Wilbert Henry, Walt Kessling, and Johnny Blood McNally represent the Maroons in the Hall of Fame. The city of Pottsville still celebrates the Pottsville Maroons' stolen championship, while a request to re-examine the 1925 championship was declined in 1967, with the St. Louis Cardinals leading the opposition, Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell lobbied the NFL in 2003 to reverse the decision, with President George W. Bush even riding in favor of the Maroons. But the title still remained with the Chicago Cardinals, and still does to this day. Well, that's all for the Pottsville Maroons. Yes, I, I remember the Pottsville Maroons. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Stay tuned for more Defunct Teams and Hate Week coming up soon. And thanks to our special guest, Pops. Uh, glad to have you today. Anything else you'd like to add?
Did I ever tell you about the time that I was expelled by the league for bringing a loaded gun and trying to shoot a referee? Uh... Want any more of that reconstituted starch you call pudding? I said that I wanted to have my banana and watch the better TV show that you put on. Not the one with the crazy man and the stupid juggling act. You, they call that a soap opera.